Gabrielle is a San Francisco real estate broker and investor with more than 18 years of experience. So far, she has published three books about real estate investing and is working on the fourth book in the series. She lives in San Francisco with her cat and loves to travel off the beaten path and connect with people, their cultures, and languages. Please welcome Gabrielle Doms. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. I am going to um, start sharing my screen. No, no, no. Hang on. Here we go. And then we'll go to the presentation. Okay, perfect. So everybody hopefully can see the presentation in the background. And I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for your interest in negotiation strategies and tactics as they pertain to real estate. All right. I, having said that, I would like to, let's see here whether I can actually advance the slide. There we go. Sometimes you have to forgive me, the slides don't advance when I tell them to. <laughs> anyway, I just quickly wish to reiterate what Christy also just said, and that is that nothing in this presentation is either legal or financial advice, and that you always ought to be consulting the appropriate professionals uh, about your situation, your goals, and also uh, any particular property you're talking about. All right. With that, let's move into what we'll cover today. The first one is why negotiate, meaning the importance of negotiation. Then we'll talk about negotiation pillars and negotiation in real estate. We'll address some strategies and also some tactics. And then of course, you will get a few takeaways at the end. Let's see the next part, one second. All right. Okay, the next part of course is that if you've attended some of these uh, webinars that I've done, then you've already seen this slide and I sometimes uh, change it up a bit, but in case you don't know me yet, here is just a little bit about me. At the bottom, you see the books I've written thus far. The fourth volume is currently in production and should be coming out within the next couple of months. At any rate, just a little bit about myself. I have been in real estate some 20 years both as an investor and a broker. And I am a longtime resident of San Francisco. I've been in San Francisco almost 30, no, 30 years, actually. Long time, I've seen a lot of changes. Some of you may be natives, some of you may have come more recently. So all there are changes like in all places. And the next part is that I possess both a bachelor's and a master's in real estate, uh, real estate, yes, it would, would be nice. In history, that's a Freudian slip. <laughs> and uh, that often informs the way I present and also the way my books are written. All right, the next part is that I was raised in Germany and then um, have lived in this country a long, long time. And finally, that I love to travel the world when I can. My uh, Right now, of course, it is a little more difficult to do that. We're still in the pandemic. And my next uh, trip that I'd love to do is actually going to Bhutan and doing some trekking there. All right, you've seen uh, this slide. Now you know a little bit more about myself. And um, let's go to the first poll. Christy, would you please do that? May I will launch this poll. Yeah, so for those who are on the phone, it says on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable are you in negotiations? Not comfortable at all. And Kirstie, I can't see the rest of the answers. 
That's just oh. a scale of one to 10. Okay, scale one to 10, not comfortable at all to very comfortable. Yes. All right. That's very important information. I thank everybody who's answering that particular poll. Thank you very much. Are we complete with the poll? Yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. I always have to get out of that screen. <laughs> Having said this, let's get started with this question with the presentation and the following question. That is, what image does the term negotiation actually conjure up in you? Uh, is this what comes to mind? Perhaps you, like many people, uh, believe that that's what you have to be, that it, negotiating either means having to deal with a shark or assuming the role of a shark. If that is the image you have, you are not alone. That said, most of us have some idea of what negotiation means. And we actually engage in negotiating all the time. Whether in our personal or in our professional relationships, and we even negotiate with ourselves. <laughs> I certainly do. One of the reasons, however, that we feel either that we are poor negotiators or just don't like it, meaning I have, I really don't want to negotiate, I don't like it. One of those reasons is that asking for what we want might bring judgment from other people to us. And if you're like me, you probably dislike being judged. And of course, being a shark or being seen as one is even worse. This is of course something the media has has perpetuated that view of having to be a chart. And that makes for great TV, but it's actually less applicable to negotiations. And the intent of today's presentation then is to navigate negotiating terrain in better ways. All right. Our topic is real estate negotiation. And that is in the buying and the selling process meaning the objective is to consummate a transaction. Sometimes we refer to transactions also as deals, and we all want to do a successful investment in property or whether it's buying or selling, okay? The parties in negotiations have something at stake. And for this reason, What's at stake for you as well as for the other party is important to know. Do you have a lot to lose? Does the other party have a lot to lose? How are those stakes different for you and for your bargaining partner? Now, we live in San Francisco and the market here remains high priced. Even during the pandemic, property sold some of it for large amounts over asking. But even if you're in a seller's market, how much of a property sells for depends on individual negotiation positions. What I mean is that every seller sells for different reasons, for instance. Well, they might be retiring or they might go through a divorce. People might have inherited property. They might have... Uh, lost a job or other such other situations apply to them. All of these sellers that I just mentioned have different timelines. They also have different interests and finding out those details, meaning a seller's interests and constraints will strengthen your negotiating position. When doing that, you set yourself apart from other folks in the market, and that is true even in a seller's market. All right, all of these tenants that I just mentioned 
are actually applicable to all negotiations, whether in real estate or not. And next, let's go to a list of what's negotiable in real estate. The first one is price. And that's what most people think about immediately when thinking about negotiations. All right, the second one is terms, meaning timelines or certain contingencies. Then we have inspections, which can be uh, put into a contract as a contingency. Next, we have repairs, and repairs and inspections are often connected, all right? Uh, and then down payments. Most of us believe that down payments are less negotiable, and sometimes that is true, but not always, okay? So we'll, we'll get into some of these things. And then, of course, you can also uh, negotiate leasebacks or redbacks in the property. There are other things, many other things you can negotiate. Contracts are, are completely negotiable. Now, whether everything, even though everything is negotiable, is also doesn't mean you, you should be negotiating at all. So choose what's most, uh, what's most important because that is actually what's gonna set you apart and help you to get what you want. I hope that makes sense. So for instance, other things you could negotiate would be uh, home warranties or HOA dues or parking fees, et cetera. Okay, let's talk about another uh, tenant or underlying uh, part that, that is um, important in negotiations. Oh, there's one more, closing cost. Okay, I'll add that as, as the last one. Let's go to the next one. So here is, you see the skills and you will see the concept of fairness. Well, the reason I put this in here is that immediately when you come to the negotiating table anywhere, the concept of fairness shows up. Well, what does that mean? It means that uh, sellers want a fair price. It also means that buyers want to pay a fair price. And of course, both parties have ideas about what fair means in this case. So I'm, knowing that, knowing what a seller considers fair, what a buyer considers fair, those are very important components. Now, when it comes to price, it's going to be uh, what the market dictates usually. But still, there might be other things that you could do to uh, pay a fair price, which is not just about price or the dollar signs on it. All right, uh, how do you arrive at that solution uh, that actually gives fairness to both parties? That's another component. Instead of going on on this, uh, let's go to the next slide, if I can get there. Here, no, it's not, there we go. And that is the value of money. The reason that slide is in here is that money is about people's values. Perhaps that is the value of money. Uh, we're not talking about inflation here. We're not talking about the economics of money. We're talking about what actually underlies the value of money. So if you have $100 and I have $100 and what, whatever we decide to, you decide to spend that money on, whatever I decide to spend that money on, uh, really will show our values. Maybe not right away, but eventually it will show up. Okay, so even though negotiations are ostensibly about money, they're never about the money. Does that mean sellers don't want to get money? No, it just means that they have a certain attachment, if you will, or certain values that this money that they want represents to them. This is true for buyers, of course, as well. And that's because we infuse, all of us infuse our uh, you know, money with our values, as I already mentioned, with those things that are most important to us. So money is a symbol, and it, as such, it's personal. And 
in real estate investing, this becomes important because money can represent security, it can represent pleasure, it can represent freedom, it can re represent education, it can represent philanthropic interests and so forth. There are many more, of course. Um, to make sure that, you know, to do, to understand what values you ascribe to money is a, an excellent start. And once you understand that, it will make it easier for you to understand the other party. Um, so the other party's values, wants, and needs are just as important as yours. And that is some part every negotiation benefits from in terms of preparing for it. So that's why we're talking about this. I know it's a longer presentation. I have, uh, I think, a resource in the bonus PDF that you will be getting after this presentation that uh, talks about the value of money and so forth. And maybe in ways you've never thought about it. Okay. And really what you want is, you know, some sellers will tell you, well, you know, what, what do they want? I just want the most amount of money I can get. Well, why is that important or why that answer? Uh, the answer is actually becomes more nuanced. So your agent can ask them, if you have an agent, okay, can ask them about, uh, about what they value most and a good agent will be able to read between the lines, all right? And uh, you should have a conversation where you actually assess what's most important. Of course, everybody wants to get the most amount of money and every buyer wants to pay the least amount of money. So that is, um, the conversation that is really important in negotiations, you need to understand what money actually means in the context of a negotiation and uh, become a, aware of the values and um, what, that, what that actually means. So study the subject and um, yeah, study the subject in detail if you can. Let's move on to another negotiation essential, and that is ask for what you want. Well, ask for what you want sounds easy, but it's actually often very difficult. And the reason it's difficult is that fear may immediately raise its ugly head because asking for what you want is often considered both selfish and brazen. Yeah, that's part of... Uh, uh, different cultures, it's part of what you know how to please others, etc. And asking for what you want it right away. That's one of the main reasons many people dislike negotiating because they're not asking for what they want. Now, there is, of course, a, a caveat to asking for what you want. It's one thing to ask for what you want and be what I call realistic about it. And it's another thing to ask for what you want, and it's totally out in you know, the stratosphere somewhere. Dream, and by the same token, understand that asking for what you want needs to be tied to what's actually not possible, but what's actually required in the negotiation you might find yourself in. Yeah. Um, all right, the, the last point I wanna say about this, uh, asking for what you want is that sometimes people believe that they must give a justification for what they want. Well, you can, but I don't recommend it. I would say state it and leave the justification out. All you have to do is ask. No, no justification necessary unless the other party wants you to give one. All right. And uh, now the other component to this is you naturally must know what you want. If you don't know what you want, it's going to be very difficult to ask for what you want. So that's that's important. And when you know this, uh, it helps you to stay in control of emotions and also to know when to walk away from a negotiation. This is actually very important to know that component. All right. 
since we're talking about that, knowing the party, the other party, the party you are negotiating with is absolutely essential. Why is it? Because all negotiations are really about people. And negotiating, by definition, means finding agreement. Well, finding agreement usually involves the other party because you have to come up with something that's acceptable to you and to the other party, all right? Because of this, what the other party does and says or what you do or say affects the process of negotiating. And it also affects, of course, uh, whoever your counterpart is and how they're responding. So very important components. Um, you know, we've already mentioned sellers sell for different reasons, for instance. All of that is going to be important in having a conversation, because if you don't know that, if you don't know why they're selling, it becomes very difficult. Yes, and in that case, your agent may just tell you, oh, go to the highest possible dollar amount you can go. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. Uh, many people, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area markets, have done just that. They're beating others out by offering the highest and best price they can come up with. But they may still do that and understand why they've done that in the first place. So it's not just about dollars. I hope that really makes sense. Now, the art of a negotiation in knowing the other party is to engage the dialogue. Again, if you have an excellent agent, the agent will know how to do that. And uh, that's, that's just so important. I can't really overstate it. Dialogue of this sort requires an immense amount of skill. It also requires information, timing, and experience. Um, so, Great negotiators learn this craft, usually one negotiation at a time. And now we'll go to the next important negotiation tenet, which is get to know fast. It's probably contrary to what most of us have heard because we fear rejection. We fear hearing no. But for most negotiations, no becomes a starting point in actually negotiating. Now, again, in high priced markets, you have to do some of that before so you don't get the no when you're competing with 13 or 20 other offers. So that's where it becomes a skill to actually assess the no and what where rejection would sit. And again, that goes back to what I said in the previous slide, and that's about knowing the other party, knowing their motivations, knowing their values. Now, you may not know all of it, but you will get a very good idea if you know what, you, uh, what you're looking for. And this is, of course, very important to know for yourself, all right? Um, having said this, again, those tie in with fear and rejection and all the things that we want to stay away from. <laughs> and uh, well, that's, by the way, one reason why people engage agents, because they don't want to deal with rejection. They don't want to deal with having to either be rejected or, uh, or giving a rejection. Uh, in either case, it's a very uncomfortable position. So agents, a good agent will help you do, you know, navigate that terrain. Now, having said that, why are no's so important? Well, no's actually give you the other party's uh, bottom line in some ways. And they allow for you to come up with solutions to what the other party might need to solve. They may have a problem, you know, they may need money now uh, versus being able to wait for a year before the money arrives. Uh, they may want to get out of a property for emotional reasons. 
Um, again, I, I think I, I mentioned um, probates once before. I mentioned divorce sales, that kind of thing. There are emotional components to these sales that are very important when it comes to negotiating and understanding what the party would, would say yes or no to. Uh, once you hear a no uh, or assess where that would be, then concessions will be possible. So sometimes you don't hear need to hear that no right away. But again, in a, in a high value market, which is a seller's market, you want to assess what that no would be before hearing it. You don't want to hear it. You want to assess it so you can make concessions that are the right concessions. I hope that makes sense. All right, so uh, this process has, of course, powerful psychological effects. And then the other part to that is to understand that there are two types of no's in, uh, that exist. And I'm just going to keep it simple. One is what I call the final no. That is a no that actually uh, closes the door and says, no, I'm not accepting any of this. Goodbye. When engaging such a no, it becomes very difficult to come back to the table with that party because if, if they backpedal, the negotiation is no longer in their favor. So whoever issues a no of that kind, uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation to get out of. So instead, my recommendation is if there is a no involved, to say, you know, thank you so much. Currently, my answer is no. But if X, Y, and Z occurs, uh, I might be able to, you know, we might be able to come back to the table. I hope that makes sense. And let's move on to, um, to what's next in our discussion. All right. And that is strategies and tactics in negotiating. Uh, they're synergistic, right? Uh, what are strategies, what are tactics, and how do they work together? Well, strategies really define long-term goals, meaning they are um, a plan or plans for how you and I want to achieve whatever goals we have in mind. They're more, um, they're more of an overview, they're a plan, uh, and they, they help you to show which way you need to move in order to go toward that, toward fulfilling the plan. And that's where tactics come in, because tactics actually are specific actions and also specific resources that you can employ to achieve the plan, the goal of that plan. For this reason, they're synergistic and they have to align, which is really important. So uh, here is, uh, here's a little uh, fun about uh, a strategy that could land you in, in, in difficult terrain in a morass. By the way, um, the cartoonist has uh, generously uh, granted permission to use this in this presentation. I'm very grateful to, to him for that. And there's another cartoon and the same applies to that later on. Okay, so hopefully you are getting a little chuckle uh, and uh, from, from this cartoon. All right. Um, now let's go to real estate investing strategies. Well, what are they? Let's find out. The first one, if it comes up, is cash flowing. So that's that's your plan is you want to cash flow. You want to make cash right out of the gate. And sometimes, again, in high value property markets, that's very difficult unless all your money is tied up already in the property. Uh, in which case, yeah, you're getting cash flow, but your money is tied up in it. So uh, it's, it's almost, so there's no leverage involved in that scenario. So finding something where you get leverage and you get the cash flow, meaning the income would be one strategy, okay? The next one is appreciation, which is 
what many people go for uh, because they, they believe that their property is gonna, gonna appreciate in value and therefore they're going to make a lot of money. Well, that's true for some properties or I should say for all properties if you hold them long enough. Um, I will just tell you, I have, a, I have a land investment where you know that's been sitting there and has been going down in value uh, over time. And that particular, the, the, there's no cash flow on that land. And it's, it's an appreciation strategy. However, it's an unfortunate occurrence that the value of the land has actually gone down. So it's, it has depreciated, not appreciated. And when choosing this strategy, just be very careful. <laughs> I speak from personal experience. Um, anyway, one of the, uh, the, the third one is a combination of cash flow and appreciation. And cash flow and appreciation would be, um, you know, would be great because if you get cash flow and then the property also appreciates while you hold it for five or seven or 10 years, and then you get that at the end when you sell it, that's wonderful. And that's, you know, that's of course a, an ideal scenario. All right, so some uh, sub strategies would be to wholesale properties, to fix and flip properties, uh, to, um, uh, to sell or finance properties. Those three options are all about cash flow, okay? Because you're creating cash flow. And uh, then buying and holding, uh, buying paper or, or refinancing, uh, you know, their cash flow and in like with the refinance, both cash flow and appreciation is involved because your bank will never refinance a property that has that has no appreciation or appreciation potential. You probably already know this if you own uh, a property and you've done that. All right. So given uh, given that there are, there are other subset strategies which include uh, I repeat, divorce sales, bankruptcy sales, probates, HUD homes, um, short sales, REOs or foreclosures, and many other variations on the theme. So I'm giving you some of these strategies uh, because they fall in different categories and subcategories, and they all converge. In, in those categories, obviously, according to the category you uh, select, okay? So it needs to match. So if you want appreciation, you would probably not ever wholesale anything because you are leaving the appreciation to the next party coming in, all right? The... Um, yeah, so this is, this is really important and... We only have really time for these particular uh, components that I just mentioned. And uh, some of those strategies I've used, some of them have served me quite well. Others, as I just mentioned, uh, were, I call them learning experiences. And all learning is expensive, usually. <laughs> um, anyway, the next part to this is when uh, there is another strategy that's called adding value. So adding value is really important because if you think of negotiations as a kind of currency uh, to which you can bring value, then creativity in adding such value becomes important. So some landlords, if they had multi-unit buildings, uh, add value by putting in dishwashers and units. Uh, what does that do for them? It allows them to uh, charge more rent. Now, I'm not talking about rent control. Uh, I'm not talking about all these things. I know there are different variations on the theme, so it must make sense to you. Some people have uh, put in parking, and again, they get to charge more money for adding value. <clears throat> for their tenants. I'm going to have some water. One second. Mm. 
Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so usually when adding value, you want to look for something that's uh, cheap for you to give and yet very valuable to the other party. So I just uh, mentioned, mentioned some of those, uh, those parts. There are many, many more, only your creativity. Uh, and of course, rules and codes, what you can do and can't do uh, can you know, inform uh, your value a different way or the adding value a different way. So I'll, I'll give you one example of what I did for one of my clients uh, in one of the negotiations. Uh, we added value by paying, uh, you know, by, by giving a higher sales, uh, sales price, which is what the seller wanted. But what we got in return, so this is also a concession, what we got in return was the seller paying the closing costs. It's totally negotiable. And that seller liked us, understood that we were likely going to be the highest offering he would ever see, and uh, that it was in his best interest to move this direction. Now, I won't go into all the details, but you get the idea, right? So it's, it's, it's a great way. Um, you know, another one in, the, in San Francisco, in the city and county of San Francisco, I represented another buyer uh, for which we, uh, you know, we offered a lower price for this property. But we offset that by paying for the seller's city and county transfer taxes. The seller was was delighted, didn't want to deal with it, and uh, you know had had less uh, of a tax basis, all this other stuff that benefited her, and uh, she was happy to go that direction. Hope that makes sense. All right, so there there are many more examples, but you get the idea. So adding value is important. Now let's come back to people. <laughs> and what I will say is to create a little romance. Seems kind of weird that this would be showing up in a presentation on negotiating. Well, it's not. All relationships, if you work on that relationship, if you, if you want to understand what the other party uh, you know, what they value, what's, uh, what's important to them, uh, how they view the world, that kind of thing, it's going to go a long way. All right. So um, the other thing uh, I want to say about this is, uh, I think it was uh, Barbara Corcoran, the, the real estate uh, tycoon, who, who's on Shark Tank, or was anyway, um, it, it, she talked about how, or talks about how uh, if you know a seller, for instance, accepts the first offer, the buyer usually uh, has remorse because they're like, uh, "Really? They're accepting that?" And especially if it's not just a, a, a stratospheric price, okay. And this also works the other way, all right. So rather than uh, in that scenario, remorse of, on either the buyer's or the seller's side often set in. And, you know, because it, it, accepting that really engenders doubt and also questions about the other party, about what they would have accepted, about what you could have done, all the coulds and woulds you can think of. Okay. Now, this applies, of course, not only to price, but also to timing and other terms of the contract. Okay, so work on the relationship. Uh, walk away with that piece of, um, of insight, and hopefully you can apply it. All right. Um, the, the last thing I'll say about that, for sellers especially, don't just accept the first offer come back with a, with a counter offer, however small it may be, and then see how it develops. Sometimes you'll find out that it's either completely the right offer for you or not. So, uh, you know, because until you're in a transaction with someone, you never know that other party. 
You can do all the homework, very important. All right, and number three is focus on solutions. I think that was three. <laughs> and what I mean by that is cultivate a win-win attitude and mindset versus being con confrontational with the other party, okay? Uh, many of us have been taught that negotiations are about going into battle. And I'm here to tell you that's not true. It is much more about focusing on solutions and, uh, and, and then making things work from there. And the reason for this is, think about it, it's probably happened to you. If the other party goes into battle, what do you do? You follow suit. Not a good scenario. And then, you know, uh, if some people eventually, for that reason, will refuse to deal with the party who's confronting them, who's battling them. So, you know, just be very careful how, um, how to use how to how to use confrontational items in negotiations focus on solutions instead and here is a quote i love because it brings together strategy and tactics uh, sun tzu the the great warrior uh, said and strategist said strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory and tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat I couldn't have said it better. That's why I put it in here. All right, let's go to some tactics. Yep, it's a step-by-step -step approach. Complement your strategy with tactics. We're gonna go into some. Uh, tactics, however, depend on yet another skill. What's that skill? It's observation. Again, that comes back to all those things that we've already talked about, and especially understanding the value of money, whether to yourself or to the other party, understanding the motivation, understanding what's happening with the property. By the way, the property will give you clues at, at times, okay? Uh, so the other part to tactics is tactics can shift. Your plan should not shift. <laughs> unless you have a plan that needs reworking, okay? But if you have a good plan, then what, what needs to happen is your tactics need to be flexible and adjustable in order to meet any changing conditions that might, might occur. And by the way, they will occur. Uh, things change, they do change. And uh, that's, that's important to know. By the way, the more experienced you are in negotiating uh, and, or the, the, I should say, sorry, I'm gonna take that back. The more experienced you are in relating to people and in negotiation from that vantage point, the easier tactics will become. All right, let's go into a few uh, tactics. And the first one is to prepare, 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 and prepare. Uh, I know this sounds, uh, this <laughs> sounds like I'm beating that horse every time. And it's true, <laughs> I am. Without preparation, I personally have never met a great negotiator, an excellent negotiator who did not over prepare. So all those items that I mentioned, they address them from every possible vantage point. They did their homework on the property, on uh, what what the you know what they want, what the other party wants, all of those things. All right, there is absolutely no shortcut. For, um, for preparation. This is so important that uh, I will say this, the people who are excellent at negotiations will seem to be doing this effortlessly, seem to be doing the negoti negotiations effortlessly. What's the reason for this? Well, they're completely prepared. Uh, they're prepared, they can adapt their tactics to the strategies they employ, all right? 
And, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's so important. I can't, I just cannot overemphasize it. All right. So you obviously need to be competent in what you're doing. You need to be knowledgeable about the market, about people, uh, about uh, all of that. You need to be likable and trustworthy. If, if you do business with someone you don't trust, it's not going to last very long. Your negotiations are going to go down the drain. And uh, that's, that's really important uh, to know. So communication styles, the values of the other parties, the values of the assets uh, you are dealing with, the value that you can add to the transaction, uh, all of those apply. Uh, one example what for in my career has been for a young couple who uh, were looking at a home in Berkeley and the home looked fine. It was, it was priced competitively in the neighborhood. And then we did our, uh, our homework and we started digging uh, and so forth. And lo and behold, it turns out the property was, um, and this was not apparent uh, from looking at it or even being inside because it had been updated, but the updates were cosmetics that, uh, that eventually just camouflaged the, uh, the, the real work this property needed, which was something like $400,000, which my buyers had to, A, uh, they could have raised it, but they had no interest in that. They wanted to have a life <laughs> because it's not just the dollars, it's also time, effort, and all the energy that goes into that. So information is the greatest weapon. And I, I use that uh, in this context. So it's the greatest weapon in any negotiation. So know your stuff, <laughs> know your stuff. Okay, tactic number two seems to be self-evident, right? Most of us know, intuitively know that this is what we ought to be doing. But it's not as easy as it appears because active listening takes, uh, takes an interest in the other party. I'll just put it like that. And the reason is that listening is an art uh, instead of listening, but already, con already contemplating what you're going to say to what the other party just mentioned. <laughs> so there's a whole different, different approach. And by the way, people know the difference. They know it. They may not be able to articulate it, uh, but they are, uh, they know it. Um, I'll just say that. So active listening is uh, putting, is about putting your agenda on hold while listening to the other party. Um, and, you know, that is so important. I cannot, I can't uh, emphasize that. I'll just leave it here. Uh, you can look up some, I, I, there were some great quotes about that, but one of the thing, things is, um, I will uh, quote Mark Twain here, who said, and please don't take offense, it's not my words. He said, never miss an opportunity to shut up. Um, so that's, that's what Mark Twain said. I couldn't, again, this is, this is very straightforward and to the point. All right, the next one is, next tactic. The one question always to ask, this is my opinion and my experience. I will just tell you, here it is. What's that question? Is that the best you can do? Is that the best you can do? Now, you may want to say it in a way that's actually, um, that's friendly uh, and, and takes into account all the other stuff we just talked about, okay? Now, in bidding environments, sometimes that comes up and we are in bidding environments here in the San Francisco Bay Area, of course. Why is this question so important? So let's address that. Well, for one reason, it is so important because it puts the other party on notice that you are actually serious. <laughs> it may not sound like it, but it does. So the other party knows you're interested. There is no doubt about it, okay? And uh, it also puts the other party on notice that uh, you want the best deal you can, you can get and you're gonna ask for it. 
So again, that comes back to asking for what you want. And um, yeah, it's, it's important. It also uh, leads to understanding the other party's bottom line. Because sometimes, guess what? When you ask that question, people say, oh, yes, this is, I, I, you know, I, I can only do X. And they will tell you what it is they can do. And uh, that's important. That's important to know that will help you to either stay in the negotiations or walk away from them. It will tell you a lot of different things about the negotiations. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, one more sip. All right, next we have when going to the negotiating table, finding points of agreement first sets a positive tone in the negotiation versus going, well, I can't do this, right? So you set a positive tone, you, you look at what is it that, that we're actually in agreement about and go there. It emphasizes a meeting of the minds, coming to agreement, which is what negotiations are all about. And it sends um, an unconscious or a subconscious message to the other party uh, that you want to do just that. You want to come to agreement. Does that mean the other, the, the disagreed on issue goes away? Well, no, it just means that you're putting the toughest issue uh, last. By the way, everything I've said thus far applies to all business negotiations. It, it's not just real estate, it applies to everything, okay? So uh, it's very important um, and I encourage you to, uh, to do this. And here's our second cartoon. Uh, coming, talking about, you know, how easy it is to blame other people for one's own decisions, whether that is a bad uh, strategy or tactics that don't work. Okay, so going to that, I hope you're enjoying them. Again, thank you to the cartoonist, to the creator. Gabrielle? And now a quick recap. Gabrielle? Go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know the time. It's 1.54. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, we're almost done. So <laughs> we're almost done. Here we go. Thank you so much. All right. Um, ooh, no. It, it went to the next slide. Not good. <laughs> so melding ta uh, strategies and tactics are obviously important. Now, we've only gone into a couple, two, three, four of these. Okay, so there are way more. I'm just giving you some uh, stra strategies and tactics that actually work. And well, they all work, but sometimes you want to become fluent, if you will, uh, as though you're speaking another language in those particular ones, and then move to the next one. You might, you know, uh, you might find some other tactics that are better for you. And that's fine with me. I'm just giving you some examples and hopefully putting on your creative hats, you will see there's way more to learn here. Um, so master maybe two or three different tactics and add them to your arsenal and then uh, move on to the next one after that, okay? Uh, in real estate investing, uh, your goal may be to find the right type of uh, property, the right investment, the right income, uh, you might want to mitigate risks, you might want to pay uh, fewer taxes and, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of different, different things that you may want to do. Um, you know, it, when, you, when you learn just, just a few of these, you will gain in confidence. And confidence, uh, I think I've said it before, equals gaining momentum. So that's very important because uh, you got to start somewhere, like all of us. <laughs> all right, let's recap. The takeaways are prepare, prepare, prepare. I start with that because that is underlying everything. Second one, no needs and wants, your own and the other parties. Um, 
engage market knowledge. You may want to do this by engaging some professionals uh, like myself or reading some books or whatever it is you need to do to do that. All right. Number four, hone communication skills. Be direct, listen, listen again, stay calm, practice patience. All of those things sound so easy, but are so difficult. <laughs> and uh, focus on relationships and on interests. Let's go to the next slide for the remaining ones. Make offers and proposals. Why am I putting this here? Well, I'm putting it here because we can talk about all of this and you can say, oh, yes, 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 yes. And then never take action. So the only way you're ever going to practice any of this is by making offers and proposals, by actually doing it. Uh, and then when you're in a negotiation, use concessions. We talked about that. Uh, and then last but not least, Thank the other party. Thank the other party. This is so important uh, that as many people forget it, but you may find yourself in a position where several years later, that same party shows up again. And if you thank them and you left that relationship in a good way, they will be completely open to doing business with you. Very important. All right. And here is the, a quote from Napoleon, uh, take the time to deliberate, but when the time for action has arrived, stop thinking and go. That comes back to the point I made in the previous slide. You need to act. By the way, Napoleon Bonaparte was an exquisite strategist. So if you want to learn about strategy, you may want to read about what he, uh, some of the things he did. And the library has great materials. Okay, we've come to the end. I will just tell you there's a bonus. You will get that. I want to uh, tell, say a great, very warm thank you to the San Francisco Public Library and remind you that your feedback is absolutely essential and valuable. So please send your feedback in. Uh, it helps all of us and we appreciate it. Thank you again. Have a fantastic time starting to negotiate and gaining confidence. Thank you Chris, so much. Yeah, back to you. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. That was another great presentation. Thank you. Um, we will be sending a follow up email to everyone after uh, this afternoon. It'll include that survey link, a uh, link to the recording, uh, bonus. Uh, content from Gabrielle, which are resources.